In 1912, Julia Child, originally Julia McWilliams, was born to well-to-do parents. In those days, servants were cheap, so they had to live and cook. And cooking was not part of her mother's or of Julia's early life. She was a natural ham, like moi, a social butterfly, and loved to have fun. Then World War II came and everyone wanted to do their part. So Julia and a bunch of friends went to Washington, D.C. First, she was a typist in the U.S. Information Agency. But then she started working in the files as a research assistant and then later a researcher for the Secret Intelligence Division of the Office of Strategic Services, which later became known as the CIA. She typed out the names, information, and whereabouts of over 10,000 U.S. secret agents on note cards. And she helped develop shark repellent. While she was stationed in Salone, she met her future husband, Paul, who also worked for the OSS. And while she was in China, where the local food was delicious, but the military food stunk, she first became interested and started having conversations about food. Her and Paul got married, and at age 32, Julia started cooking. And at first, she was awful at it. They moved to Paris where Paul worked as a cultural attaché in the American Embassy, and Julia had her first French lunch, Sol Meunier, and she said it was the most exciting meal of her life. The waiter said bon appetit, and she couldn't get over how delicious it was. This became her passion, and she started studying cooking at La Cordon Bleu. Simone Beck and Louisette Bertoli, who had also studied at La Cordon Bleu, had been working on a French cookbook for American readers. But their third colleague died, so they asked Julia for help. And after nine years of writing, researching, editing, testing, and retesting recipes, they completed Mastering the Art of French Cooking. To promote the book, Julia went on one of the first book tours, appearing and doing cooking demonstrations on different local television channels. And the PBS in Boston had a show called Ivan Reading. Normally they had intellectuals on, but their original guests canceled, so they had Julia. And so many people wrote in asking for a cooking show that they asked Julia if she would do a series. In the early 1960s, most women were housewives, so they had the time to devote to serious cooking. With advances in airplanes, it now only took a few hours to travel to Europe. And the Kennedys, who were always big news, had a French chef. So the timing was perfect for the French Chef TV series. And they chose that title because it would fit in one line in the TV guide. And Julia had originally hoped to have some real French chefs on. At first, the budget was so low that her and Paul had to do their own grocery shopping. They brought in their own pots and pans. And at the end of taping, they would auction off the food. But it had a great time slot, Monday night at 8 o'clock. People in Boston loved it. PBS channels all over the country started airing it, and stores would stock extra of whatever food or kitchen appliance that she was going to be showing. Julia won a Peabody Award, and even a Primetime Emmy Award. We did 201 episodes in 10 seasons! And we're doing the top five today in the French Chef. Every little breeze seems to wait for Louis. Earth in the tree seems to wait for Louis. Each little rose has me it knows I love you. Number five, croissants. Julia loved croissants, and her excitement is contagious. She makes you want one too, or two or three. She talks about how buttery and flaky they are, how she'll have them in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, at night, with a meal or as a snack. There's never a bad time for a croissant. And at the end of her episode, she makes eating them look so good. Normally, she'll recommend a good wine. But here, she recreates having a continental breakfast in Paris. She has her croissant with jam, she drinks cafe au lait, and even reads from a French newspaper. It is the ultimate way to enjoy a croissant. So you can really feel like you're having breakfast in Paris without even making the trip. That's all for today. This is Julia Child. Bon appetit. She also makes them look fun to make. Julia was six foot two, 
and there is a physical robustness to her cooking. And I love it when she kneads the dough and softens the butter. You hear every thump. The best way to soften the butter is to beat it up first. Just bang it down. You can be very rough. I think a lot of people think you have to be delicate in cooking, but you don't. Wham! They look like a joy to make and certainly a joy to eat. Number four, cheese souffle. Julia felt that education was the most important thing on the French chef, but also believed in including humor and that cooking was inherently dramatic. Now, cheese souffle is a delicious, elegant, and iconic French dish, but it can be a little intimidating because if it cooks too long and gets too dry, it will collapse and your whole meal will be ruined. But her endearing and cheerful personality and teaching skills makes you feel like you can do it. Now cheese souffle is made with a white sauce, eggs, cheese, and butter. And aside from wine, butter is her most famous ingredient. This isn't the kind of thing you want to make if you're on one of those hideous diets. Because it uses a lot of butter and that's what makes it so good. And don't use any substitutes, because butter is a butter! I remember my grandma saying that, and as an ingredient, butter gives food this cozy grandma's home cooking quality. And that's part of Julia's warmth. She says these kind of silly grandma-ish jokes. She explains things in ways that are easy to understand. Like when you serve the souffle, you take the spoons and go plunk! And she offers you encouraging, helpful hints. When you're learning any new skill, like driving a car for example, it's important to know that you're in control. And Julia makes that the theme of the episode. Under this golden dome lies an uncooked, unrisen, unbaked souffle waiting patiently to go in the oven. It's going to fit into my time schedule, not vice versa. See how to be the big boss of the big cheese souffle today on The French Chef. It sounds silly, but that's how it's going to help you remember it. Then she breaks down the steps into universal cooking techniques that she's already gone over in other episodes. And she gives you examples of things that could go wrong. And how to fix them. It feels like she personally believes in you. And you walk away feeling like, I can do it. And my friends and family will love my cheese souffle. This is such a beautiful cheese souffle, and it makes a lovely lunch with a nice green salad and a nice burgundy wine. Do it just as we've done it here, and the important thing is how to time it, so that neither one of you collapses. Number three, to roast a chicken. Julia felt the true test of a good chef was the perfectly roasted chicken, so this is an important one, and she grabs your attention right away with the funniest little opening you will ever see when she explains the different types of chickens. Now let's pretend that these are chickens. Julia Child presents the Chicken Sisters! Miss Broiler, Miss Fryer, Miss Roaster, Miss Cabinet, Miss Skewer, and Old Madam Hen! But we're spotlighting today Miss Roaster of the Year! We needed 14, 15, 14! We're roasting this chicken today on the French Chef! Julia had a great sense of humor, a zest for life, and is a fun person to watch. She gives her show what the French call je ne sais quoi, that indefinable something. It is groovy to see all the chickens laid out and to hear what wine, vegetable, and French bread to eat with your meal. During the credits on this one, you can even spot her dancing in the background. Food is part of life, and Julia enjoys life. She always knows her information, but it's how she loves sharing it with you that makes it such a joy. We've heard of a cubby of quail, and a gaggle of geese, and a pride of lions. But this is known as a peep of chickens. That is their official name when they're in a group. It's a lovely name, a peep of chickens, and I'm sure it's true, too. However, she also knows when to get serious and cares about the food that we put into our bodies. 
You could tell that her tone changes when she warns you about chickens being given growth hormones, and when she explains the importance of cleanliness when it comes to chickens. Oh, I like to wash my chicken! I just think it's the safer thing to do! Although, in your state, they have the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA inspections, and every chicken is fine. And we talked to them the other day, and there are much better inspections nowadays than there were. But if you live in a state that doesn't have good chicken laws, you write to your congressman and get something done about it. So don't be a chicken about your chicken. Even though Julia wasn't in battle, she was put in life-threatening situations during World War II. This is a woman who believed that it was hers and everyone's responsibility to stand up for what's right and to fight against what's wrong, specifically here, poor chicken laws. So along with learning how to roast a chicken, you learn a lot about Julia as a person. She believed in enjoying life, but also that you have to have courage and not accept the unacceptable. Number two, The Potato Show. The book, Mastering the Art of French Cooking and the French Chef TV Show, were designed to open up Americans to the delicious world of French food and make it accessible, which was Julia's experience. Later, she cooked tripe a la mode and pressed duck, but early on, she was breaking the ice with more familiar foods. Americans were already digging their potatoes, but as she explains, most were not aware of all the different ways that you could cook them. Do you ever get tired of baked, boiled, mashed, and fried potatoes? Well, if you do, tune in on us, because I counted 200 recipes for potatoes in a French cookbook the other day. We've done four very nice ones, so we have 196 to go! She does two potato main dishes and two side dishes, and all of these recipes include our good friends, cream, cheese, and butter. Now the French chef was filmed on a process called live on tape, where you film straight through like a live show, but then it's broadcast later. And this was the big step up from live, because you were able to film during normal working hours, not 8 o'clock at night, and if something huge went wrong, you had the option to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to stop and restart. But for minor things, you would just keep going. So Julia will make mistakes. She'll mess up her words. She'll lose things. She'll sweat and she'll make a mess. I've got the heat up so high I'm just getting boiled. Now there's a whole grove of garlic in this press and it goes garlic all over the stove but into the potatoes too. While she's flipping a large French potato pancake, it falls apart, which is hilarious. But it's also something that could happen in a real kitchen. Julia felt the difference between her and Martha Stewart was Stewart was inaccessible, whereas people watched Julia and said, well, if she could do it, so could I. So you're able to relate to her, and cooking like her is attainable. I'm going to try and flip this over, which is a rather daring thing to do. Whenever you flip anything, you just have to have the courage of your convictions to do it, particularly when it's sort of a loose mast like this. You see, I didn't have the courage to do it like I should have. Now, anytime that anything like this happens, you haven't lost anything. Because you can always pick it up. And we can pretend that this was supposed to be a baked potato dish. We can add some cheese and cream to it. After all, you're alone in your kitchen. Who is going to see? So she turns this massive mistake into a teachable moment. And shows you what to do if you make the same goof. Then she decides to go for it again and flip another large potato pancake. But this time she waits till it has a firmer crust. So it's okay to make a mistake. You just learn from it and you try again. I think I'll do a great big potato pancake so I can flip it. And I hope it works this time. I'm going to flip this by gum. There. You see, that was much easier because it has a crust on it that held together. Before we move on, I would like to do the honorable mentions of Julia's top three kitchen appliances. Number three, her fright knife. That's what Julia always called it. It's her 20 inch long stainless steel knife. And I love how she looks scary when holding it. 
Two of Julia's pet peeves were bottled salad dressing <laughs> and unsharp knives. When she would go to friends' houses to cook, she would bring her own because their knives were never sharp enough. But this one sharpened beautifully and always did the job. Number two, her blowtorch. A blowtorch is perfect for caramelizing the top of creme brulee or for browning the meringue on a baked Alaska. And like flambéine, it adds the theatrical flair to your cooking. For the general public, Julia introduced using a blowtorch in cooking. Nowadays they make smaller ones specifically for that, but she had to use a large old-fashioned brass one. So for the audience at the time, it looked crazy. And that's why I love it. I think every woman should have a blowtorch! And the number one kitchen appliance is this rolling pin. Julia thought American rolling pins were too small. She called them Pins Toys, and in one episode, tossed one over her shoulder. So her husband Paul actually made this one out of an old broom handle in the garage. Call me a sentimental fool, but I love that story. And for me, just watching her use it, you feel their happy marriage. And the number one French Chef episode is Gâteau in a Cage. This is such a creative, elegant, and delicious cake, and I would have never known about it if it wasn't for the French chef. It's like a French version of a strawberry shortcake, but it doesn't have to be strawberries. You could use other fruits too, or even candied chestnuts. The spectacular part is, the cake is surrounded by this dome of caramel, which tastes and looks amazing. Now they actually go on location to Paris, and Chef Dublier, who invented this cake, makes it. And it's so groovy to see such expertise. He decorates it with little birds on top, which makes it look even prettier and more festive. And we're told that during Christmas time, he decorates it with the three wise men. At the end, he even does some bird songs. Talk about je ne sais quoi. One thing I always love about the occasional use of on location footage is on the show they built the kitchen set extra high to accommodate Julia's height. But here, standing next to Chef Dublier, you really appreciate how tall she was. Now this can be a challenging cake to make. Making caramel is no joke anyway. But to make this dome, you have to drizzle a caramel all over the bottom of a bowl. And once it's hardened, very carefully take it off. Now, as I mentioned, Julia thought cooking was dramatic, and it is suspenseful watching Julia take it off, because you're wondering, is it going to break? What's going to happen? And because it is such a tricky dish to make, Julia gives this very inspiring pep talk to the audience. One thing I think is people get so afraid when they see a recipe that calls for sugar syrup or caramel, they go, oh, I won't try anything like that, oh. It's this awful American syndrome of fear of failure. And if you're going to have a sense of fear of failure, you're just not going to learn how to cook because so much of cooking is one failure after another. You've got to develop what the French call Jimmy Fatisma, which means I don't care what happens. The sky could fall. Omelets could go all over the stove. I'm going to learn. I shall overcome. That sort of women's liberation and all that. For one thing, no one knows quite what you intend, so you can serve them one of your failures, and they maybe think that's what you intended. So in other words, learn how to make sugar syrup, or you won't learn how to make this beautiful cake. This is a life lesson that could apply to anything. Julia thought the Food Network was great, but because it was commercial television, its focus had to be entertainment. Whereas the French chef was on PBS the same network that brought you Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street. It's about learning. And Gâteau in a Cage helps you learn how to make a beautiful cake, and it helps you learn how to make a beautiful life. After the French chef, Julia would go back and forth between writing books, which paid more than PBS, and doing cooking shows. She was the first iconic TV chef, and her kitchen set is in the Smithsonian Institute. She would guest star on other shows, and was even famously spoofed by Dan Aykroyd on Saturday Night Live. 
Always with a great sense of humor, Julia loved that sketch and would show it to her friends. Now remember to say you deliver! You can put it on a cracker, a Ritz cracker, or a salt team! Her husband Paul died in 1994, and Julia died in 2004. In 2002, Julie Powell wrote a blog where she did every recipe and mastering the art of French cooking in one year. She turned it into a book, and then it became the movie Julie and Julia, where Meryl Streep did an amazing job at playing Julia Child. In the movie it is mentioned that when Julia was shown this blog, that she didn't think Julie Powell was very serious. Julia was 90, so you've got to give her that. She wasn't especially interested. And remember, Julia, Simone Beck, and Louisette Bertoli had spent years testing and retesting these recipes, and the book was known for its well-detailed, in-depth instructions. Whereas Julie Powell was trying to meet her deadline, and if she made a mistake, including not having all the right ingredients, she wouldn't try again, she'd just move on to the next recipe. It was a great blog, but in terms of cooking, it did go against what Julia thought, which was to keep trying till you learn. I enjoy cooking with wine! Sometimes I even put it in the food! And this episode is best paired with a lovely California red! Now as you embark on good cooking, remember, an egg can be your very best friend if you give it the right break! And diet food should only be eaten while you're waiting for your steak to cook! That's all for today! This is Julia Child, Bon Appetit! Hey, 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 hey,